Good evening and welcome to an all-new season of Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays is where we take a look at local, state, and national news through a progressive perspective. On this week's show, and back by popular demand, uh, we're bringing you an interview with Brian Thomas uh, and our new segment producer, uh, host Vincent Trombator. Uh, Brian Thomas, as you probably will remember, is the newly elected alderman in Opelousas for District A. And uh, this interview was first brought to you in December, but because of the holidays, a lot of people missed it. So they asked us to bring it back to you, and we are more than happy to help out and do that. But first, as always, this week in the news. Senator Landrew and Senator Snow try to find some common ground. Uh, Senator Landrew and Snow, uh, Snow is from Maine, as you may know, uh, have joined forces to find some common ground in the United States Senate. Uh, they recently appeared on MSNBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews. Here's a clip from that show. Congress in a big fight about this because they are... They need comfort that we know what we're doing and how to get out of it. What's it like in the cloakroom of the Republican Party right now? Because we hear a few people like yourself taking a public position. Then we're hearing a few people take the other side, like Cornyn and um, I guess the usual suspects, uh, Kyle they're, and McConnell. They're on the, the president's side of this right down the line. But so much silence is coming from your cloakroom. And uh, because I think there are, uh, you know, senators who are obviously have differing positions and views uh, on this question. They want to be supportive of the president, frankly. Does silence mean Inter consent in their case? Well, I, no. I think uh, they're trying to. Fi I think trying to figure out what should be the alternative, uh, what should be the response on behalf of those who, you know, support the president and his policy, and those who differ. And I think that's what they're trying to work through now. Brad Pitt and Angela Jolie, or Angela and Jolie, are both moving to uh, New Orleans. Will that be an economic spur down there to your people? <laughs> it is. Not only, not only has it been an economic spur, because they've bought a beautiful home right on the edge of the French cash, Quarter. Cash, probably. Uh, probably <laughs> cash. And, uh, but it's been just a spiritual uh, lift, I tell, between Brad and, uh, and Angela and the Saints. We're, uh, we're doing uh, really well and exciting. And, and, you know, it's been hard recovering from this flood. As I said, we survived the hurricane. What we couldn't survive was the multiple breaks of these levees that put this great city underwater and a country, frankly, that really didn't have a plan Good for luck the Saints. Disaster. They might make Good it to the, the ball. And Brad and Joe Lee are going to come help us rebuild. And the Patriots? <laughs> the Patriots just beat San Diego. They're tough. Patriots, you know, I guess I have to be loyal to my region. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Senator, uh, Landrew, uh, Senator Landrew of Louisiana and Senator Snow of Maine. You know, it's great to see Senator Landrew leading the way in the Senate, trying to find some uh, uh, middle ground and the common ground that the majority of Americans want to see. You know, it's too bad that the far right wing has controlled all of the legislation uh, for the past six years uh, through the House and Senate, which has basically prevented a lot of these common means and a, a lot of these uh, common goals from even coming to the light of day in either the House or the Senate. It's great to see Senator Landrew leading the way and we owe her a debt of gratitude uh, so definitely log on to our website at landrew.senate.gov and let her know that you appreciate all of her hard work in trying to build some common ground Senators Levin and Hagel bring bipartisan, no-confidence uh, vote in the Senate against the Bush's uh, troop surge that was announced last week. Uh, Senators Carl Levin and, uh, from Michigan and Chuck Hagel from Nebraska, who's a Republican, uh, joined together in a resolution of no confidence in the president's plan uh, to surge troops uh, into Iraq, uh, basically into the Iraqi civil war. Uh, this, re uh, this resolution that they have... Uh, really has no legislative teeth, uh, but it does show the sense of the Senate uh, with regards to the Bush, Bush administration's uh, failed policies in Iraq. Uh, we reported last week, just after President Bush announced this surge, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, many have questioned not only will the surge work, will it actually see some tangible, reasonable outcomes uh, to make a more positive environment over there. Uh, however, 
The problem is, is that Bush has now announced that uh, in order to reach his uh, some 22,000 additional troops for Iraq, that we're going to be taking additional troops out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan, as you'll probably know, is now basically being taken back over by the Taliban. You'll remember the Taliban, you know, the guys who helped Osama bin Laden attack us on 9-11? Yeah, they're basically going unpunished, and they're becoming quite rich over there with all of their drug fields. Uh, the drug lords and the Taliban are now basically controlling the area, and uh, it's a match made in heaven because the drug lords are making the money, they're paying off the Taliban, and they're taking back control of Afghanistan, which is, is quite troubling. Uh, so Bush now thinks that, okay, we're going to take more troops out of Afghanistan, leaving the ones there in very dire straits, uh, kind of like trying to put your finger in a dam uh, to stop the water, and then we're going to move them into Iraq. The problem again with the Iraq thing is now it's been announced that our soldiers will be living in the small neighborhoods in Baghdad that are under fire constantly. We're going to now expect our troops to have no off time whatsoever, no time for them to actually take a sigh relax for a few minutes of not having to worry about every potential person coming up to them or that they run into is going to try and do them harm. It's unbelievable to me that they're going to do this to our sons and daughters that are over there. It's reprehensible. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, announcement is often met with uh, we must win and we can't afford to fail. Well, I ask the Bush administration, I ask anyone who is supporting this, what does winning look like at this point? How do we know if we have won or will win? Is that even possible at this point? I'm sure some and many could probably argue that it was never possible. But if they're arguing we must win, surely there should be a definition of what that winning may or may not look like. Uh, it's unbelievable to me that we're still that we're dealing with all of these problems. Uh, you know, to put more of our country's treasures in there, not only, uh, again, uh, the, our sons and daughters, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, but uh, to also be dumping all of this money in there just seems that it's ridiculous. You know, we really as a people must stand up and say no to this. Uh, the next steps... Uh, while the Senate resolution carries really, like I said before, no legislative teeth, it will carry a deal, a great deal of political teeth. Uh, if the president doesn't start listening to his advisors, to the generals, the Iraqi commission that he put together, the bipartisan commission, if he doesn't start listening to these individuals, then he's going to have some majorly significant problems to deal with. And the American people seem have given the license to this Congress to say, do whatever means necessary, get our kids out of there. I'm hoping that they're going to listen. And if they have to, they're going to use the power of the purse to do so. Uh, they can pass legislation that will actually denote where this money can and cannot be spent. And it might be time, if the president doesn't wake up and listen to these people, um, it might be time to do that. Uh, no matter how they have to do it, the American people seem united behind uh, this Congress to get it done. Uh, if not, we're going to hold them accountable. Uh, more on this in our clip of the week. President Bush continues to try to sell his plan. Well, you know what? He's been marching out there trying to sell his little uh, plan out there, much like uh, uh, Procter & Gamble launch, launches its new products. Uh, President Bush is out there trying to sell it. It seems to invite every reporter and any reporter that would actually talk to him out to Camp David for his long weekend. Uh, Bush has appeared uh, on almost every network, and Dick Cheney has appeared, of course, on Fox. Uh, with his good friends over there spreading their propaganda. And it's interesting, during those uh, interviews, uh, they keep saying, well, where's the plan? Where's the plan? If we're not going to do it the way the president wants, where's the plan? Um, how about uh, the Levin Amendment that actually talked about a phased troop withdrawal uh, and putting them in a phased redeployment? Uh, how about that plan? How about the plan that the Iraqi group put together, uh, led by uh, uh, former Secretary of State James Baker uh, from Daddy Bush's administration? Uh, there are two I can think of, and there's many more of them out there, uh, like the Jack Murtha plan. Uh, unbelievable to me. Uh, here's a clip from the countdown with, Cle uh, with Keith Olbermann, uh, our idol here, uh, as he covers the interview with Jem Lehrer uh, as he sat down with President 
Bush out at Camp David. Take a look at the clip. If you were to take an, put me in an opinion poll and said, do I approve of Iraq, I'd be one of those who said, no, I don't approve of what's taking place in Iraq. On the other hand, I do believe we can succeed. Is there a little bit of a broken egg problem here, Mr. President, that um, there's instability and there's violence in Iraq, sectarian violence, Iraqis killing other Iraqis, and now the United States helped create the broken egg and now says, okay, Iraqis, it's your problem. You put the egg back together, and, uh, and, and if you don't do it quickly and you don't do it well, then we'll get the hell out. Yeah, I, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't quite view it as the broken egg. I view it as the cracked egg. Cracked egg. Uh, that uh, where we still have a chance to move beyond the broken egg. And, uh, you know, if I didn't believe we could keep the egg from fully cracking, I wouldn't ask. 21,000 kids to go in, additional kids to go into Iraq to reinforce those troops that are there. If it's that important to all of us and to the future of our country, if not the world, why have you not, as President of the United States, asked more Americans and more American interests to sacrifice something? The people who are now sacrificing are, you know, the volunteer military, the Army and the U.S. Marines and their families. They're the only people who are, are actually... Yeah sacrificing anything at this point well you know uh, I, I think a lot of people are in this fight I mean they, 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 they sacrifice peace of mind when they see the terrible images of violence on T TV every night we I mean, got a fantastic economy here in the United States but yet when you think about the psychology of the country it is uh, it is uh, uh, somewhat down because of this war now here in Washington when I say people what do you mean by that they say, why don't you raise their taxes that's, that'll cause there to be sacrifice. I strongly oppose that. Uh, if that's the kind of sacrifice people are talking about, I'm not for it, because raising taxes will hurt this growing economy. And one thing we want during this war of terror is for people to feel like their life's moving on. General Casey said yesterday, that the commander said, that um, it may be spring or even summer before we have any signs of success from the new program yeah. from the new new strategy and even then I can't guarantee you that it's going to work that's the general that's the guy who's the commander well I look I mean I, I think that's an accurate I think that's, that's a sober assessment well it's a sober assessment I think he's not going to stand up and make guarantees that uh, that may or may not happen but he is also the general who felt like we needed more troops and he's also the general that believes this is the best chance of working he would also be the general who insisted that he did not and would not need a surge in forces in Iraq, stating it might actually be counterproductive. The same General Casey who might be brought home early from Iraq. Let's call in our own Jonathan Alter, also, of course, senior editor at Newsweek magazine. John, good evening. Hi, Keith. Well, let's start with Mr. Bush and sacrifice, and one is almost speechless at the president's bundle of disconnects sometime. But to equate deaths, just the 3,000-plus American deaths, to a loss of peace of mind at home. Is this the new low-end measure of his tone deafness? Uh, it's pretty low. I mean, for him to claim that that's some kind of sacrifice, just to use a little historical context here, Keith, President Bush is the first president in American history to ever cut taxes in wartime. The whole idea of raising an army in every other war we've had, big and small, Spanish-American, doesn't matter what war you're talking about, raising an army requires raising taxes. Otherwise, you're having your children and your grandchildren pay for your war instead of doing it uh, contemporaneously. And when he says, well, raising taxes would shut down the economy, it's important to remember that the last time taxes were raised in the 1990s, the country, in, in the immediate aftermath, instead of the economy going down, we actually started the largest and most sustained boom in American history. So this, this idea has been slam dunked by recent uh, history. So he, he was talking nonsense there uh, about sacrifice. And then he engaged in doublespeak, Orwellian doublespeak, when he said that General Casey supported this policy and asked for more troops. In fact, General Casey said the exact opposite of that, Keith, on many occasions. He was the one who has said that we need to turn over responsibility to the Iraqis uh, other, otherwise, things will uh, just get worse. The Broken egg, 
Cracked egg? What the? Uh, unbelievable. Uh, the key is, why haven't you asked, um, the key question uh, in that interview was, why haven't you asked the American people to sacrifice? Why haven't the American people been asked to sacrifice something? Right now, that seems to be the disconnect. And while people are upset with this and have taken a while to kind of warm up to uh, the idea of things are not working over there, why hasn't the president asked the American people, us, to sacrifice something? Instead, he went on a tour when we launched this war, say, go shopping, go shopping. Government auction, everything must go. Um... In an almost unbelievable story, Keith Olbermann takes a look into the Pentagon's recent garage sale uh, where the items they sold actually ended up in the hands of members of the Axis of Evil. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me with this. Take a look. But our winner is your Department of Defense Surplus Auctions Division. A government accountability office investigation shows that the Pentagon auctioned off literally hundreds of lots of stuff to just about anybody willing to buy them, even though the items were not supposed to be sold to the public. Items included missile components, fighter jet parts, things like that. And they're not going into the hands of collectors. Chinook helicopter engine spare parts were sold to a guy already convicted of exporting U.S. missile elements to, wait for it, Iran! He promptly sold the Chinook parts to Iran. And investigators are terrified that the Iranians might also have been able to buy, from a guy who bought them from the Pentagon, parts for the F-14 Tomcat fighter. Now, why would Iran want them? Because decades ago, we sold Iran F-14 Tomcat fighters. The Pentagon's Army Surplus Auction House, today's worst persons in the world. You know... It's almost too much to believe. The Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez, personally dismantling the Constitution one right at a time. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez recently made an appearance and offered testimony in the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, and gave several speeches around D.C. Uh, in this clip, Gonzalez takes on the judges. Here we go. Prior to last year, interim prosecutors were appointed by federal courts. Gonzalez claims that the judges tended to appoint their friends. Meanwhile, one of his appointments turns out to be a 37-year-old whose resume reportedly includes helping the RNC dig up dirt on Democrats. Mr. Gonzalez will testify about all this tomorrow and possibly also about another swipe at the judiciary branch today, talking about what he and the president look for in judicial nominees. We want to determine whether he understands the inherent limits that make an unelected judiciary inferior to Congress or the president in making policy judgments. That, for example, a judge will never be in the best position to know what is in the national security interest of our country. That statement followed later by Gonzalez and the president backing down to a judge who said their warrantless wiretapping program was unconstitutional. Mr. Gonzalez announcing that the program is now being run under the oversight of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is precisely what the president insisted could not be done without endangering American lives. That is, back before Democrats in Congress won the subpoena power necessary to find out which officials might be violating the Constitution. So I'll make... Excuse me, but how dare you, sir? How arrogant do you po could you possibly be um, to say that our third co-equal branch of government just doesn't know what they're doing and couldn't possibly understand, therefore we shouldn't even deal with them, is un. Believable. Not to mention, it's creating a constitutional crisis right here, right before our eyes. Um, then the administration loses in all of the trials and all of the court hearings so far, facing and facing a loss actually in the appeals court. So now they say, "Oh, my bad. Sorry, we're not doing it anymore. So forget it that we ever did it in the first place. Uh, move on with your business." Um, uh, not so fast. Again, you need to be held accountable for this. Nobody can go in and go out and say, kill 15 people and say, oh, you know what? My bad. You're right. Um, I shouldn't have killed those people, so I'm not going to do it anymore. So we'll just forget about that. what happened. You can't do that, okay? You can't do that. This administration has not been held accountable, and by God, people in the Senate and people in the House are going to hold them accountable. And uh, here is an exchange with the chairman of the Ju Judiciary Committee in the Senate, Pat Leahy, who is 
uh, questioning Alberto Gonzalez and a lot of the questionable means that they have employed in using extraordinary rendition. Take a look. Well, if this was the first time that the Attorney General appeared before the Judiciary Committee since the Democrats took over control of Congress. And I can tell you, it was hardly a friendly reception. Democrats pounced on several of the administration's anti-terror policies, including domestic wiretaps and the detention of terror suspects in Guantanamo Bay. But the most heated exchange came when Judiciary Chairman Senator Patrick Leahy brought up a man named Meher Arar. Now, he's a dual Canadian and Syrian citizen, and he was deported from the U.S. to Syria, where he says he was tortured. Arar was allegedly on a watch list for suspected terrorist ties. He's since been cleared by the Canadian government. Listen to this, Wolf. We knew damn well if he went to Canada, he wouldn't be tortured. He'd be held, he'd be investigated. We also knew damn well if he went to Syria, he'd be tortured. And it's beneath the dignity of this country, a country that has always been a beacon of human rights, to send somebody to another country to be tortured. Before you get more upset, perhaps you should wait to, to, uh, to receive the briefing. How long? I'm hoping that uh, we, can get, we can get to the information next week. And Gonzalez and other U.S. officials have said that they got assurances from Syria that Arar would not be tortured. Leahy promised Gonzalez that if he didn't get the information that he wanted within the week that he promised, that he would hold a hearing on the issue, Wolf. He's been cleared by the Canadian government, but is there still suspic suspicion in the Justice Department, in the U.S. government, that this individual may have had some links to terrorism? Yeah, uh, actually, Senator Leahy today said that he is still on a U.S. watch list, and he wanted to know why from the Attorney General, but the Attorney General refused to give any details about that case, uh, at least in a public forum, Wolf. Uh, maybe that's what he's talking about next week. They'll have a private briefing. Uh You've got to be kidding me with this. I hope that Leahy follows through and gets to the bottom of this just as soon as possible. To, uh, to even wrap your mind around this, Canada is one of our closest allies in this. After all, we share a huge, huge border with them. And yet, we were going to send this guy over to a third world country where they are going to torture him within an inch of his life when he has a dual citizenship with Canada. Canada wanted him. They wanted to be able to investigate him. But instead, they personally sent him over to the thugs. It's unbelievable to me that these types of things happen. And guess what? This isn't the only time it has happened. This this is the example that they've trotted out because Canada is furious over this. Possibly why they have hardly any troops now left in Iraq, if any at all. You know, it's time we start working with our friends and neighbors in this world. We are not in it alone. We have to start working with our friends. And by the way, while they're at it, they might want to actually engage the State Department and actually start talking to some of our frenemies. You know, the ones that we're basically in a pair of golden handcuffs with, like the members of OPEC, like Venezuela, like these other countries, and say, look guys, we were in it and we helped you out multiple times. Like, oh, how about the time that we went in and helped and got uh, Saddam out of Kuwait? It's about time for you to return the favor and help us over in Iraq. We need to have a coalition. But why does the president not do this? It's simple. It's oil. And right now, in the Iraqi parliament, they're going to be discussing who's getting the oil revenues and who's getting the big contracts. Well, I guarantee you, guarantee you, that they will be American companies over there because we are forcing out any type of competition whatsoever over there. And to me, that's reprehensible. We deserve what we get if we don't start working harder to involve more of the global community in trying to make a better place out of Iraq. In our clip of the week this week, Jon Stewart takes a look at the president's speech on selling a product. Take a look. Uh, but mainly tonight I wanted to begin with consumer news. Last week saw two major new products introduced. First up, Apple's Steve Jobs. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. And we are calling it iPhone. I'll take 8,000. <laughs> God, he's good. Obviously, people excited about the combination I thing. <laughs> and now the other product, Iraq. I've committed more than 20,000 additional American troops to Iraq. Thank you, and good night. 
You know, uh, you'd think planning a major speech like that, someone would have checked the White House for crickets. But <laughs> clearly, the president's product launch receiving a new cokeish welcome. So the president's advisors launched a PR offensive to assure the public that just because our new way forward meant returning troop levels to where they were in December of 2005, this plan had a twist. There are a whole series of things that we are doing different. A new strategy that will yield different results. They will succeed rather than fail. <laughs> succeed rather than fail. Sounds counterintuitive. Hmm. But here's why this might work. The old plan asked an awful lot from the Iraqis. Our policy is stand up, stand down. As the Iraqis stand up, we'll stand down. <laughs> See, if they didn't stand up, we're waiting to like But this new plan changes that and addresses the so called up down loophole. It is time for the Iraqis to step up. That starts most importantly with the Iraqi leadership in Baghdad stepping up. They, in fact, need to step up. Now, you may say the White House has merely replaced the word stand with step. Touché. <laughs> you may also point out that, as was reported recently, the Iraqis can't run a single battalion on their own. Well, the White House is ready for your negativity. If you don't like our idea, you've got a better one. We want to hear it. All right. If the uh, Democrats don't like what we're proposing, it seems to me they have a, an obligation to, to put forward their proposal. If somebody's got a better idea about how to do this, we want to hear it. Now you may counter, I thought that's what the Iraq study group was for. <laughs> or the Levin-Reed amendment calling for phased withdrawal. Man, you're a real downer. <laughs> but okay, I'll indulge you. You have a plan. Well, have you thought about looking at that plan in the most emotionally loaded way possible? Ask a simple question. If the U.S. withdraws, does it make Osama bin Laden happy or sad? You know, John, you and your friends over at The Daily Show uh, keep us in awe over here. Thanks for doing what you're doing and keep up the good work. And that is your Democratic News and Commentary for the week of January 22nd, uh, uh, 2007. Uh, we would like to remind you that Blue Mondays is on each and every Monday night here on AOC Channel 15. Uh, every single Monday night, that is. And it's rerun a few times throughout the week. So if you miss us here, check our website and we have uh, dates and times for when you can catch the re-airings of our show. Uh, not to mention, every single Tuesday morning, you're able to see us online. Yes, that's right. Our show is uploaded each and every Tuesday morning where you can watch us on YouTube. Check out youtube.com forward slash AOC Blue Mondays. Uh, we'd glad to see you there and possibly see some of the clips that you might have missed. Also, every single Tuesday morning after you watch the replay of this show, you can click on over to theadvertiser.com. There, each and every Tuesday, I have my column called The Left Blog. You'll definitely want to uh, check that out, read it, and let me know what you think. We greatly appreciate all of the comments. Um, also, something that we cannot forget, Democracy Now! is on channel C AOC Channel 16 every single day at 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, that is an incredible show, and if you haven't been checking it out, you've got to see the reporting that these guys are doing they're amazing for the small resources that they have they put together an incredible show that is now being used as an example of how free media needs and ought to work they're doing a great job and uh, lastly we don't want to remind you to check out the Lafayette Democrats website there you'll see a lot of different happenings for the progressive community on the Lafayette Democrats website you will see different links to meetups get-togethers and also other calendar events as well as links to columns and news information that is important to you. You can also reach out to the local Democratic Party by calling their hotline at 769-7347. And with that, we'll be right back.